Today, 21st April, when I'm making this video, I do so in the knowledge, which I'm sure most of you already possess, that the House of Representatives and the United States has now passed the $61 billion package of assistance for Ukraine alongside the parallel packages of assistance for Taiwan and Israel. And there was a rag bag of other bills as well, including one interestingly to confiscate Russian state assets in the United States, which supposedly amount to some $5 billion. I think that after the vault fuss of Senate of Speaker Mike Johnson, I think there was a universal expectation, certainly there was an expectation on my part that the bill would indeed pass. I have always said that there is a majority in Congress, including in the House of Representatives, to, pro <coughs> to provide assistance to Ukraine. So it was a foregone conclusion that when the matter was finally put to a vote, the bill would pass and the appropriation would be made. What is perhaps a little surprising is that a majority of Republicans um, apparently supported this bill, but a significant number did not. And I've heard that a, a small group of Democrats also voted against the bill itself. So it, if, this, if these reports are true, and by the way, here in Britain, they're not entirely easy to confirm, then it su suggests that a small group of people in the Democratic Party are starting to have doubts about Project Ukraine and a significantly bigger group within the Republican Party are all also having doubts about Project Ukraine. And that might prove to be important for the future. Now, as to Mike Johnson's future as Speaker, I'm not going to discuss this in this programme, given the number of Republicans who have voted against um, the um, appropriation, and given how angry some of them are at what they see as his betrayal and his fa failure to get a single cent of extra funding for the border issue, I think it's reasonably plausible that he will lose his position as Speaker. He might survive with the support of the Democrats for a short time, but I can't believe that that is a sustainable position. Um, I can't believe that the Democrats will continue to support Johnson um, if the Republicans come back for several rounds to remove him. I think there would be pressures within the Democratic Party um, if that were to happen. And if Johnson was given promises that he would be supported by the Democrats to stay in his post, well, those promises might be kept for a while, but as I'm sure he will eventually discover, not for very long. But anyway, I, I'm not particularly concerned about Speaker Johnson's future. That is a matter for the House of Representatives. And as I've discussed many times, I am not an expert in understanding the parliamentary politics of the United States Congress, which seem to me Byzantine and complicated, to put it mildly. I will make on that one issue one specific point, that given the large majority in Congress supporting aid for Ukraine, a large majority which, however, is now diminishing. It does seem to me that placing all one's reliance on one individual, specifically the speaker, to prevent the appropriation was perhaps asking rather a lot and 
given the enormous pressures, it's not perhaps entirely surprising that um, he has buckled. For the future, the crisis within the Republican Party has deepened. We're perhaps closer to an outright split than we have ever been. But as I said, that is a matter for domestic politics of the United States, which I'm going to discuss, which we will be discussing, no doubt, on the Duran with people in the United States who are more expert about it than I certainly am. One thing I am going to do is I'm going to return to that compelling set of documents, statements, published um, by, um, actually, he's Colonel Bruce Slaughter. I, I mistakenly referred to him, apparently, as Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Slaughter. May I extend my apologies to him if he's listening to this programme? I've always had problems with titles, and I, I apologise sincerely for that. But anyway, Colonel Slaughter. Um, I want to return to those documents that um, he published, which I discussed yesterday um, in my programme. They are, as I said, ex outstanding documents uh, produced by somebody who has served in the US Air Force, served um, in the US military, who um, has um, travelled in both Russia and Ukraine, um, who was um, who has done tours at the embassy in Moscow and also apparently is very familiar with Ukraine, who is obviously therefore an expert about all matters relating to the Russian military and to Ukraine itself, and who is also, let's remember, a senior military officer, somebody who um, has a, a fundamental understanding of military matters. And in the executive summary, which is one of the two documents he's provided, um, which you can find on his Substack blog, Blue Eagle at Dawn, well, right at the start, you find, you find things like this. Um, uh, the Biden administration is outrageously blaming recent Ukrainian defeats, such as the collapse of the highly fortified city of Avdevka on House Republicans' failure to approve further assistance. I should say these documents were written before the, late, the latest bill uh, 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 votes in the House of Representatives. This is nonsense. Any additional funding for Ukraine will take many months, if not a year or more, to have any effect on the battlefield. The issue is not our delay in printing more money. The central problems are the collective West's chronic inability to produce weapons that have already been used up on, in the war. Kiev's critical manpower sh shortage and the poor strategic and tactical decisions made by President Zelensky, his top generals, and the White House. Ukraine was running out of ammunition and men just two months into its six-month-long counteroffensive after the United States and NATO had provided just about every piece of war material Kiev requested. The West's chronic supply line problems, replacing, replacing what the Ukrainians have expended, and the Russians' ability to destroy, were well known before President Biden made his current request. This is obviously true. It is factually incontrovertible. I go back, if we go back to the story of last summer's Ukrainian counteroffensive. I remember, I think it was in September, or was it perhaps December of 2022, I don't remember when, but General Zaluzhny and General Sierski, who were telling us at the time that they were the best of friends, gave a long 
interview to The Economist in which General Zaluzhny spoke about the weapon systems that he would need in order to capture Crimea. And he asked for 350 main battle tanks, five, uh, uh, six to 700 infantry fighting vehicles, and 500 155 millimeter howitzers. He got all of it. He got all of the things he asked for. He also got, well, by some reports, up to a million shells, half a million at least, from the South Koreans. He launched his offensive, and the, fa the offensive failed disastrously. The Russians defeated it. And exactly as Colonel Slaughter says, two months into the offensive, the Ukrainians were already running short of ammunition. In fact, I'm going to make a suggestion, this story of ammunition shortages, of weapons shortages, is going to recur run continuously right up till the moment when Ukraine finally collapses. The Ukrainians will always say, however much they're given, that it is not enough. We will have these recurring dramas, which have been going on now for years, of the West scrabbling around, trying to find weapons uh, that are in short supply, badgering weaker member, NATO member states to get them to part with whatever shells and guns and air defense missiles they have. The United States doling out more and more of what it has and diminishing its arsenals ever further. And, well, for a short time, it gives the Ukrainians a brief shot in the arm and then the effect goes and they come back for more. We've seen that with air defense systems. We've seen that repeatedly happen with shells. We've seen that happen with high Mars rockets. We've seen the inflation of demands as well. So first it's high Mars rockets, then it's storm shadow and um, scout missiles. Then of course it's attackers missiles. Now there's a apparently renewed demands for Taurus missiles from Germany with the uh, one of the German industrial managers, I think, of Airbus, but I think he's actually the, involved in the production of Taurus missiles, contradicting Chancellor Scholz, um, in effect saying that Chancellor Scholz is wrong and that the Ukrainians can be put in a position where they can use these missiles by themselves. You can already see the, pres the pressures coming together. Ukrainians always short of tanks, always short of infantry fighting vehicles, always coming back for more. And the West always struggling to keep up with these demands. And the Russians, by contrast, well, they've had shortages as well. There was a period of time, apparently, in the late autumn, and early winter of uh, late autumn of 2022, winter, the first winter months of 2022-23, when there were restrictions on uh, shell expenditure. But because they are in control of their own production, because they understand their own needs, because their production system is organized for war in a way that in the West it is not, they are always, in the end, able to satisfy their ultimate needs for further production. And, of course, Colonel Slaughter also refers to the realities about um, manpower. He makes the entirely valid point that the Russians have been able to recruit, I think it's 420,000 men in um, over the course of 2023, and more have joined the military in Russia since then, whereas Ukraine is having to pass ever more draconian mobilization laws with uh, resistance 
to joining the draft steadily increasing across Ukrainian society and more and more young men seeking to evade the draft and escape into the West, to the West. Uh, scenes, by the way, and a number of people have made this point now, scenes of young Ukrainians trying to swim across rivers, escape across increasingly heavily guarded border zones, scenes that in Europe we all thought had ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Anyway, these are the realities that an extra $61 billion of aid are not going to change. All the more so as if you actually break this appropriation down, the aid package Ukraine is getting is actually slightly less in terms of military uh, material is actually slightly less than $14 billion. The $60, $61 billion includes various items, including items to build up American stockpiles rather than Ukrainian ones, something which, if it's to be done from new production, is going to take a significant amount of time. Anyway, there we are. I fully predict, predict that at some point in the next few months, always assuming, of course, that Ukraine is able to get through the next few months, the administration, if it is still in power, will come back to Congress and ask for more and more and still more, because it's clear also to me that for the president himself, and some of his top officials, it is Ukraine which is the overriding priority, more so than almost any other issue, be it foreign or even domestic. Now, let me just return to a point that I made yesterday about why the United States was so reluctant to see an all-out war flare up in the Middle East. It didn't want a war between Iran and Israel, and it put enormous pressure on Israel to limit its response to the strike carried out against Israel by Iran. Now, <laughs> Why is that so? Why is the United States so unwilling to see a war in the Middle East? Well, no doubt there are many good reasons. It doesn't want to expose American troops in the Middle East to possible attack. It's probably worried about the state of the global economy if the Iranians close the Straits of Hormuz. But an important factor as I touched on yesterday, is that the United States is now catastrophically overextended. It is committed to supporting Ukraine in a situation where the United States is constantly having to play catch-up with Ukraine's perennially, ever perennially growing and ever-growing needs. And in particular, there's now a shortage of air defense missiles, and given the rate at which Ukraine expends air defense missiles, and given the extent to which, um, the, the limited extent to which the United States produces air defense missiles, is always going to create gaps in ca coverage for so long as it continues, and is also going to drain further American resources of air defense missiles. So, the United States probably cannot afford a prolonged missile war with an adversary like Iran. So, we see already how the crisis in Ukraine, the continued overinvestment, 
of American resources in Ukraine is straining American capabilities in other places. And if I am right, and the shortage of air defense missiles is indeed a factor in pressuring the United States to tell Israel to limit its response, well, then we can see how that overinvestment in Ukraine is starting to impact and limit American actions in other places. No wonder <laughs> there have been articles in the Chinese media, articles which, by the way, I noticed the Chinese media has been quick to take down, but they were there. I did see them. I quoted from one in an earlier program. No doubt there have been articles in the Chinese media which say that the United States is trapped in the Middle East, but most especially in Ukraine. Now, on that last topic, there's an article today, actually appeared yesterday, but it's still there, in the Financial Times, concerning Secretary, Secretary of State Blinken's forthcoming visit to Beijing, which is due to take place on the 24th to 26th of April. And we're told in the Financial Times that Secretary Blinken is going to come to China and he's going to warn the Chinese that if they continue to provide um, dual-use technologies to the Russians, machine tools and chips specifically, that enable the Russians to um, conduct the war. This is the narrative now that the Russians are able to conduct the war and have rebuilt their industrial base and are churning out all of these weapons because of the chips and machine tools they've imported from China. If the Chinese continue on that course, the United States will, yes, they will impose sanctions on China. They will start imposing sanctions, supposedly, on Chinese financial institutions. This, a couple of days after Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, was in Beijing, apparently, amongst other things, asking the Chinese to buy more American debt, which is growing exponentially at the rate of $1 trillion every three months. The Chinese are not going to agree to what Blinken is demanding. Even if they're not happy with what the Russians are doing, and of that there is absolutely no sign, even if they had been minded themselves to reduce chip supplies and machine tool supplies to the Russians, of which there is also no, no sign, they're not going to do that when the Americans ask them to do it. They do not want to be put in a, they will not want to be put in a position where they think that if they make these kind of con, where they make these kind of concessions to the Americans because they know perfectly well that if they make those concessions then the Americans will come back and demand more which is what they always do. So the Chinese will push back and if the United States starts imposing financial Sanctions, sanctions on Chinese banks and financial institutions. Well, the Chinese will respond, they will retaliate, they will buy less US debt, they will buy more gold. There are rumors that they have already been stockpiling gold, that they're the main, major buyer on the international gold markets, as they anticipate that the conflict is uh, that these conflicts that we see around the world are going to get worse. And of course, they're going to accelerate their drive to build up their own international financial institutions 
in rivalry to those of the United States. Now, there is another fact which I think US officials might want to consider, which is, of course, putting aside the colossal risks for the United States if it gets drawn into a sanctions war against China, um, the potential huge impact on the global economy and on the economy of the United States itself. One reason why the Chinese might see these threats as a bluff, and as I've said many times, the mistake one makes if one bluffs China is that the bluff is always called. But putting that aside, if the United States does start to impose sanctions on Chinese financial institutions, the Chinese are likely to ramp up support for the Russians even further. Because the more sanctions are imposed on China, the less leverage the United States has on China. Just as engaging Russia in a massive sanctions war, sanctioning pretty much everything that can be sanctioned in Russia, all it has achieved is to lose the West leverage over Moscow. Now, losing leverage over Moscow by sanctioning the Russians to the hilt has proved a catastrophic mistake. Losing leverage to the extent that it exists over Beijing would be a still greater mistake. If we talk specifically about the conflict in Ukraine, there is actually little to no evidence that the Chinese have made significant contributions, industrially speaking, to the Russian war effort. But if they do, if they ch decide to change that policy, if they calculate that they have nothing to lose by supporting their Russian friends, win the war in Ukraine and do so fast, and if they also calculate that the, their Russian friends winning the war in Ukraine is actually going to provide Beijing with more leverage over, say, the Europeans, then Chinese industrial capacity, dwarfing as it does everyone else's, and certainly dwarfing Russia's, would be the game changer that many people have been speaking about. Suffice to say that if in any one month the Russians can make 200 tanks, the Chinese can probably make 2,000. If the Russians perhaps can crank out three or 400,000 shells a month when they get all their factories in line, it will not be difficult for the Chinese to make millions of shells. I'm not going to even start talking about drones or AI drones or anything of that kind. I would have thought that was a situation which the United States and the Europeans would be seeking to avoid. And I would have thought far from wanting to put pressure on the Chinese, it would be a reason, on the contrary, for the West, for the Americans and the Europeans to tread carefully. Anyway, that's where we are with this extraordinary decision. A number of people, by the way, about the extraordinary decision to pass this further appropriation. Of course, I say $61 billion for Ukraine. The entire appropriation is around $95 billion in total. And of course, a number of people have made the point in the United States, various Congress people in particular, who are opposed to this package, that it is a strange thing to do, to make a further appropriation of this kind, which does not address the United States' growing economic problems, 
at a time when the United States faces a widening budget deficit, is piling on debt at the rate of a trillion dollars every three months, and just after no less an agency than the International Monetary Fund has publicly warned the United States government that its deficit, its budget deficit, is showing signs of getting out of control. But, strange as it is, as I have said, it's symptomatic of this administration. Ukraine, the conflict with Russia, takes precedence over everything. And I get the sense that there are some people within the administration, including the president himself, for whom this is a visceral, emotional matter. Now, in one, on one issue, one topic, it seems that the administration has so far failed to achieve what it wants in terms of getting its various allies to agree. Um, it's been piling on the pressure for months now to get the Europeans to not just freeze Russia's frozen assets, that was done way back in February 22, not just to appropriate the interest from these frozen assets, certain though that is to provoke legal challenges, which undoubtedly are coming. The administration, with its British friends, has been trying to get the Europeans to agree to seize the assets themselves, to confiscate, or steal if you prefer, the full 270 billion euros worth, or whatever it is. And apparently the Europeans have now once again said no, that the legal risks and the financial risks for the Eurozone of doing something like this are too great and it's not something that they are prepared, for the moment at least, to do. Well, we'll see for how long that holds. With this administration, I get the sense that we are looking at the irresistible force, and the Europeans have shown repeatedly, just like the US Congress has done, or at least the House of Representatives has done, that they are by no means the immovable obstacle. Probably, <laughs> at some point, the Americans will get their way. European governments will crumble. The decision will be made. The European central banks, um, criticisms, the opposition, the criticisms and opposition of the other European central banks, the opposition of all of the corporate banks in the Eurozone will be overridden. Presumably at some point it will be done, but it isn't apparently going to be done now. Well, there we are. Let's now just talk about the situation in the war, because, of course, as I've said many times, that is what is actually driving the situation. Um, what is actually happening in the war? Well, the fighting continues, and the reports this morning were of significant Russian advances. Now, the Russian Defense Ministry has just confirmed that the village of Bogdanovka, northwest of Bakhmut, and um, somewhat to the northeast of Chasovya, has indeed been fully captured by the Russian military. There were reports saying this some days ago. Um, as is always the case, the Russian Defense Ministry takes a little while before it confirms reports like this, it has now confirmed that Bogdanovka has fallen. By the way, it has also made a number of further claims. It says that there's been missile and airstrikes 
on Ukrainian positions in Kherson region west of the Dnieper River. Apparently another MiG-29 and another S-300 missile system has also have also been destroyed. The, the Defence Ministry bulletins show large numbers of Ukrainian soldiers killed in, along various front lines. But perhaps more importantly, they show that the Russians are continuing their demolition work on Ukraine's artillery systems. Artillery systems in the West are also in short supply now, as, of course, are air defence missiles. It's not clear to me that the numbers of shells available in the West, that those problems have been reduced to any particular degree. Comments from Czech officials suggest the President Pavel's scheme to buy shells in the international arms markets are not going particularly well. Um, I saw a report that instead of the 180,000 shells that the Czechs said they had made contracts for, from the 800,000 they're trying to buy, well, that 180,000 shells has now supposedly fallen to just 120,000. It could be that people are raising their price, which is exactly what you would expect. Um, arms dealers and salespeople in this kind of situation to do. I, by the way, also saw a report, which I don't know how true it is, that within the United States itself, where there have been, by the way, a number of explosions, apparently, in shell manufacturing factories. Um, anyway, I saw a report that in the United States also, the actual cost of producing shells is rising as demand for shells because of the Ukrainian conflict is growing. Um, the increase that I saw was so huge that I'm wondering whether it can possibly be real, but it is consistent with what I'd expected, that costs, the cost of shells would grow as demand for shells increases. Anyway, put all that aside, let's go back to the situation on the front lines. What is going on on the front lines in Ukraine today? Um, missiles destroyed, artillery destroyed by the Russians, but has there been any movement? Well, supposedly, the last 24 hours have seen considerable movements. Bogdanovka, the Russians are telling us, has been brought fully under control. But that was probably true some days ago already. There are multiple reports today that the Ukrainians have now pulled out completely from Berdichy and Semyonovka. And the, these two villages to the north, to the northwest of Avdevka. Berdichy, the object of intense fighting going back for months. Semyonovka, attacked much more recently. All reports, Russian and Ukrainian, confirm that the Russians control most of these villages. When I say most, 70 to 90 percent, perhaps even more than that. The Russian reports are saying that these villages have fallen entirely and have fallen completely under Russian control. I think that is probably true. I think that with Russian advances north of Berdichy, in places like Ocheretino and Novobakhmutovka, immediately to the north of Berdichy, there are reports, by the way, that the Russians have entered Novobakhmutovka and are making um, a sustained attack to storm this particular village. Anyway, those reports 
those that information had put Ukrainian defenses in the Berdichi Semyonovka area. It's put it at massive jeopardy. Ukrainian defenders there are at risk of being encircled if they stay. And as I said, there was a as I said in a video or so ago, there are reports that the 47th Mechanized Brigade, the elite brigade that has been defending Berdichi, has actually been withdrawn completely from the battle lines in this area and is being redeployed to Chasafia. So it looks as if Berdichi Semyonovka have either fallen or are about to do so. And confirmation of this is coming from the Ukrainians as well as from the Russians. Further north, the news is, if possible, even more dramatic. There are reports that the Russians have now expanded their control within Ocheretino, a relatively small village. We're not talking about a huge place again, um, but the Russians have apparently enlarged substantially the area of Ocheretino that they control. Um, they supposedly control, well, perhaps 20% of this village. Now, um, fighting is not yet reached the central part of this village, but the Russians seem to be advancing um, aggressively and they're heavily bombing and launching artillery strikes on the Ukrainian defenders in Ocheretino. And I've already said that there are also reports, which seem to be true, that they have broken into Novobakhmutivka, the village to the south of Ocheretino, which lies to the west of the railway. So, very bad news for the Ukrainians in this area, this important area to the northwest of Avdevka, and directly north of Avdevka, reports that the Russians have expanded their control of Novokalinova, the village that they reached some time ago, connected with the other village of Keramik, just to the north. Um, the Russians advanced up the H20 highway. This is a whirlwind advance that no one expected. And it seems that the Russians are now in the process of capturing that village too. So Ukrainian defense lines north of Avdevka, perhaps the main focus of the Russian assault all along, are now in the process, or so it seems, of collapse. The Russians, as I said, punching a big hole in the Ukrainian defenses in this area. And elsewhere, reports that the Russians continue to advance in Krasnogorovka, to the south of Avdevka, and further reports today that Novomikhailovka, this village to the south of Marinka, which um, has been bitterly contested for, well, something like six months, there have been at least two previous reports that the Russians have captured it. Anyway, today there are more reports from the Russians that Novomikhailovka is now fully under Russian control. And importantly, the Ukrainians are not really disputing it. They say that there might still be some Ukrainian soldiers holding out in one or two buildings on the western outskirts. But whatever Ukrainian defences are still left in Novo Mikhailovka clearly have no operational depth. The Russians will roll them over at some point within the next few hours, presumably. And it looks as if this long battle for Novo Mikhailovka has come to an end. The Ukrainians, by the way, are making some astonishing claims that over the course of the battle of Novo Mikhailovka, uh, they destroyed 300 armored vehicles of the Russian military. Um, um, some, but some commentators like Dima at the military summary channel are again taking this report at face value. Dima says it would make it 
the bloodiest and most difficult battle of the entire special military operation. I beg to disagree. I don't think we can assume that this astonishing claim of having destroyed 300 Russian armoured vehicles in the battle for this one village is true. I've seen no corroboration of it. And um, on the contrary, I can't imagine that this battle has been as murderous for either side as the fighting in that was taking place, for example, in Bakhmut this time last year. So anyway, Novo Mikhailovka, all the sides now acknowledging that it has probably fallen or is likely to have fallen. The Russian Defence Ministry confirming that Bogdanovka has fallen and that the Russians, by the way, are advancing beyond it, which may suggest that they're close to capturing the hill immediately to the west of Bogdanovka as well. And the Russians making, presumably as a result, progress in the Chasovya area, punching this big hole through the Ukrainian defences in Avdevka, capturing Novo Mikhailovka. They've apparently been conducting incremental advances, um, capturing Ukrainian positions um, to the south of um, Vuglada. It's quite likely that over the next few weeks we're going to see a sustained Russian attack on Vuglada. The Russian forces now positioned to launch that attack with the fall of Novo Mikhailovka and the, and the fall soon of Krasnogorovka. Russians also in a strong position to start cutting the supply lines to Vuglada. There's been more reports that they've advanced, by the way, in the village of Georgievka or beyond the village of Georgievka, uh, west of Marinka, which is, again, important in terms of the supply lines to Vuglada. And though I'm not going to touch upon it in this programme because always there's uncertainties and fog of war about the news, but I get the sense that the Russians are gradually tightening their, um, their net around Siversk in the north as well. So that, I suggest, is the reality. Congress can pass bills um, providing for more financial aid for Ukraine. Undoubtedly, more weapons will be provided, more air defense interceptors, probably more shells. The fact that the United States hasn't supplied shells to Ukraine for several months probably means that there is now a stockpile of shells that can be sent to Ukraine, perhaps 100,000, perhaps more than that, that will have an effect on the battlefronts. The Ukrainians likely to get more high Mars missiles. Ukraine, short of artillery, short of missiles, not enough missiles and uh, systems um, for Ukraine to alter the position probably in a month or so, perhaps six weeks, this package will have exhausted itself and the Ukrainians will come back and ask for more, which is what they always do. Meanwhile, the Russian advance, incremental as it is, will continue and the Russians will continue their missile war and their bombing war against Ukraine. Now, I said that the Russians claim to have destroyed another MiG-29 fighter jet. Julian Röpke, the German journalist for Bild Zeitung, the man, who, one of the journalists who's the most fervid in support of Ukraine, he admits, he's published a comment 
admitting that when the F-16s do finally arrive, the Russians will have no difficulty shooting them down. Which, again, puts a massive question mark over the whole enterprise. The one thing I'm going to say is that I do suspect that with the priority clearly now being to prevent a Ukrainian collapse before the November election, that priority will, that, that objective probably will be achieved. I'm not sure, as a matter of fact, whether there would have been a Ukrainian collapse before the November election anyway. But I, I suspect that the Ukrainians have been given enough weapon systems and equipment to keep going, at least until then. But the cost will be inordinately high. And the effect, as Colonel Slaughter has also pointed out, what it means is that when the collapse does come, the results are going to be even more catastrophic. Now, what else is going on around the world? Well, we've had some more news about what has happened in the Middle East, and I've finally seen some satellite pictures of the airbase close to Isfahan, which the Israelis are supposed to have attacked. There's supposed to have been a missile strike on this, in, on this installation, um, partly intended, supposedly, to destroy uh, an advanced flap-lid ra uh, radar system connected in some way with the S-300 system, which is also supposed to be defending the Iranian nuclear installations in Natanz. Well, I've seen a satellite photo. I'm not the best person to understand photos, but it seems to me that there is a smudge, which I assume is a sign that there was a missile impact. And I'm guess guessing that this radar installation was indeed attacked and has probably been destroyed. And that this was the purpose of the attack, the missile strike, that was carried out from Iraq. Now, if that is correct, and I suspect it is, then I'm afraid we probably have not seen the end of the missile conflict between Iran and Israel, in the sense that though the political impact of the Israeli strike on Iran has probably been muted, the Israelis have taken a step which implies that they have Natanz, the Iranian nuclear facility, in their target as a target. Now, the flap lid radar can be replaced by Russia and probably will be. Uh, the Russians are in the process of replacing their S-300 systems with S-400 systems. So it's a guess, I suppose, that the there are radar systems of this kind um, that can be supplied to Iran to replace the loss of this particular radar system. Doubtless, the Russians need radar systems for the war in Ukraine, but I suspect that they can at least replace this one. But the signal has been given that Israel still is thinking about attacking first, presumably, the air defense system protecting Natanz, and then ultimately maybe Natanz itself. Obviously and clearly, because they have been told not to do it by the United States, this time they've held back from doing it. The attack 
on the radar was demonstrative. It was not going to change the military picture overall. It doesn't alter my previous point that we're talking only about a limited strike, a very limited strike by Israel, one that allowed the Iranians to demonstrate resolve and which has left the Iranians ahead on points. But the Iranians must be asking themselves if the Iranians, if the Israelis really are making attacks like this, then at some point we must nonetheless prepare for an attack on our nuclear facilities. And the Israelis, or at least officials who are briefing people from Israel, now appear to be contradicting Iranian claims that the Israeli nuclear facilities at Dimona were not part of the targets that the Iranians <coughs> set for themselves. The Israelis are saying that they were, in which case <coughs> it could be that the Ira Israelis are rationalizing their attack on this radar and their threat against the Iranian facilities, nuclear facilities, by saying that their own nuclear facilities have been threatened. The White House, the administration, ought to be extremely concerned about this development. Because it seems to me that if the Israelis are signalling that they might actually at some point attack Iranian nuclear installations, there is at least a possibility that the Iranians will indeed counter by count attacking Israeli nuclear installations in return. I think they do have the capability to do that. And a couple of days ago, we had reports that the Iranian foreign minister had hurriedly visited Pakistan, which is, of course, itself a Muslim state, but also a nuclear power. It possesses a nuclear missile capability, a very powerful one. Now, I don't know what the purpose of that visit was. The current Pakistani government is friendly to the United States, but it's also been careful to maintain correct relations with Iran. I've been seeing some reports, or at least, I'm going to correct that, I have been getting some emails which have suggested some kind of relationship between Pakistan and Iran on nuclear matters. I'm not obviously able to confirm that. But I wonder, I'm thinking aloud here, whether some kind of agreement might have been reached. Emails have been sent to me which suggest that some kind of an agreement in the past has been reached between Iran and Pakistan connected with nuclear matters which ought to concern the United States. Just saying. As you will all appreciate, I am choosing my words extremely carefully. Maybe the Iranian foreign minister went to Pakistan to ensure that that agreement was still operative and secure. Just saying. So, I'm afraid it does look to me as if the danger of escalation in the Middle East continues to be very great. And I suspect it will continue to be very great 
right up to the moment when this conflict in Gaza is finally brought under control with some kind of a ceasefire being agreed there. Anyway, there we are. This is my programme today. Um, significant news on the battlefronts. A catastrophically bad decision by the US Congress, but not really a surprising one. The Russians, for their part, by the way, I ought to make this clear, are not at all surprised by this uh, congressional vote. Uh, Dmitry Polyansky, Russia's deputy ambassador to the United Nations, um, previously told the um, Iran over the course of two interviews that we did to him, Glenn, had with him, Glenn Deason and I, that he firmly expected that the $61 billion package would eventually be um, approved by the US Congress. And as we see, he's turned out to be right. And there's been comments from other Russian officials which say suggest that they also expected that this decision would indeed be made. I remain of the view that after this package, we will probably see a renewed attempt by the United States to get the Russians to agree to freeze the conflict. The Russians, of course, have already ruled that idea out. And in their public statements, since the vote in the United States took place, they've gone out of their way again to reaffirm that position, that position, and to make it clear that they will indeed continue to proceed with their special military operation and that the freeze doesn't, isn't something that they're prepared to entertain and that the vote in Congress and the new appropriations fund bill doesn't, as far as they're concerned, change anything. So there it is. War in Ukraine continues. Russian the Russians continue to advance. They continue to grind the Ukrainians down. The United States probably will supply more Patriot missile interceptors and perhaps more Patriot systems. The Europeans will probably do the same. The U Russians, in the meantime, are destroying more and more S-300 systems. They've destroyed, according to their claims, around seven Patriot missile batteries since the start of this year. They're destroying F-16 and um, MiG-29 fighter jets. Julian Röpke from Germany says that they will destroy the F-16s when the F-16s finally arrive. The <laughs> Americans probably supplying more long-range missiles, Attackums missiles. The Russians have shown that they had the capability to shoot down Attackums missiles and are doing so in growing quantities. That is the reality. The war is being won strategically by the army that is taking its time to train its men to fight against an army increasingly short of men, forced to send men to fight without the necessary training. The war is being won by the side with the deeper and bigger industrial resources. And as we've seen in this conflict, that is Russia. And, well, I don't think the Chinese want to become involved, but the United States needs to be careful that it doesn't take steps with China that might incentivize the Chinese to help the Russians in this respect, in which case the situation changes and the balance shifts decisively even more. And a crisis in the Middle East, which it is now clear to me, has not ended. The crisis between Israel and Iran continues. The administration bought itself more time, but 
it looks as if the Israelis, or at least the Israeli cabinet, is still aching to launch that major attack on Iran, which it has not given up on, but merely postponed. It's a very dangerous situation which we face globally. And I doubt that the full dangers of it are understood properly, either in the White House or amongst the political class in the United States. To all of that, I would add that I've been reading now an increasing number of increasingly alarmed and pessimistic art articles about the state of the global, or at least the Western-led, financial system. I'm not going to discuss those in this programme, but more and more commentators seem to be worried that the situation is starting to get out of hand there too. We are going to be looking at a very tense situation over the next few months and probably a critical further year. Well, this is where I finish my programme today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. Don't forget also that you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar and by checking out our shop, links under this video. If you've liked this programme, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.